thanks Sharon and thanks Carol again for being with us and for the amazing talents that you have and and, and Raymond, I don't know that you realized it, but you actually did two solos today. <laughs> uh, because on Break Thou the Bread of Life, our hymn book only had two verses, and yours had four. So, but uh, that's okay. I mean, it's kind of like that in Christianity. I mean, the, the, uh, the Catholics say the Lord's Prayer, and they have shorter Lord's Prayer than we have. We have two more verses. <clears throat> Um, or the ending of Mark's Gospel, the different manuscripts, some have a lot more verses than the others, so we're right within that tradition. <clears throat> so uh, this was one of the last books uh, that my mother was reading, and you'll see it on the screen there in a minute, The Man Who Moved a Mountain. Uh, we found it tucked in the side of her recliner chair when she died at the age of 97. And so I know it was one of the last books that she was reading. And it has her underlining in it and even some of her notes in a shaky handwriting that often comes when you're aging. Uh, I'm not sure where she got the book. And I'm not exactly sure why she was reading, but I have some theories about that, and I'll come back to it a little bit later. And in my theories and in my preaching, I'm one of those church members who you have to listen to every so often. And I feel that I'm successful if, number one, you've had a worship experience, number two, you felt like you've been in a university classroom, and number three, you feel like you've been in therapy. Um, <laughs> All of that's a part of who I am, I bring to this moment. So you, you pick up on one of those things and maybe you'll get something out of this. But I'll come back to why maybe theories about why my mother was reading this book. It's about the people of Buffalo Mountain in the early 20th century in southwest Virginia. About 15 miles from the North Carolina border, you can see the mountain, and if you're driving down the Blue Ridge Parkway, you can see it in that picture there. It's called Buffalo Mountain because it looks like the hump on the back of a buffalo. It's about eight square, mi square miles, and it looks kind of like, uh, like a buffalo from the distance. But the book is really about the extraordinary ministry of Bob Childress who carried out ministry. He was not only born there in a place called The Hollow, he also came back to minister there, and I'll tell you a little bit about his life in a moment. Uh, he was born there on January 19, 1890, and he died there January 16, 1956. Uh, this was an area settled by the Scotch-Irish in the 1700s, and the first people who came settled in the bottom land where it's rich and the soil is very productive, and they built businesses, and they built uh, churches, and they built schools, even colleges. But as uh, those people had children, and they had children, they moved further up the mountain, following the creeks and the hollows, until they got all the way to the top of the mountain, really, in isolated areas where their roads were no more than farm tracks, and the land was not that productive, and they became a very isolated people on the mountain, and they kind of liked it that way. They didn't want, uh, some people said they, they were like an island marooned, in, marooned on an island in the middle of the ocean. And they liked it because they were free of authority, they were free to make their own whiskey, they were free to fight, and they were free to raise their families, they saw fit, without interference. And they resisted the reconstruction of new roads and bridges because that would bring in the law. And they might mess up their stills. And it might kind of take on and interfere with how they settled their, their, their disputes. And the way they settled their disputes was with guns. They just kill each other. <clears throat> um, and that seemed to be a part of the normal tradition. Along with alcohol and guns, the third big giant in this area was the Primitive Baptist Church. 
primitive, meaning original, born of proud old Calvinist doctrine, as it says in the book, but freed from the constraints of education and seminaries. And their ministers said they had ironclad beliefs in the Bible, as one said, I'd believe it even if it ain't so. <clears throat> and they would preach sometimes four or five of them on a given Sunday from what they called the lids of the Bible, even though most of them could not read the Bible. But they were the ironclad beliefs, so they called themselves Ironsides or Hard Shell Baptist. <laughs> that that shell one. And they believed it, and it was the one right church. One right church. And there was a strong predestinarian belief. And so you could see it in the sermons, all of, of the funerals especially, in which every sermon would wind up saying, and God had willed the death long before the world began. It was predestined. Um, Bob Childress grew up in that environment. His first memory is age three in which he was drunk at a Christmas party. And then he lived a life of carousing, professed carousing, and fighting and drinking. Uh, and two things changed his life. Uh, number one, uh, a member from the Allen clan had shot somebody, and the law got in and took him down to the courthouse down in the bottom land. And uh, Bob Childers went down to see some of that. But the rest of the clan, defending the clan, and Bob Childers thought this was normal, came into the courthouse, shot the sheriff, sh shot everybody in the courthouse, and took their member of the clan back into the hills. <clears throat> Bob said, well, that's pretty normal behavior. But some of the national news reporters came in during that time, and he read what they had written about the mountain people as unprincipled ruffians. These wild Christian clans take the same view of the law as Bedouins on a cattle raid. And he said to his mother, they don't see the world the way we do, do they? And they don't see us really as we are. We're not all bad people. And for the first time, he got a glimpse of the world outside of the mountain, and it changed his life. The second thing that changed his life was he went to a Methodist revival. I mean, these people shot each other over theological differences. He went to a Methodist ri re revival and heard preaching that gave him peace for the first time. And he made the acquaintance of a Roy Smith who mentored him, and Roy later confessed secretly I'm a Presbyterian. Bert, you'll love that. Uh, because you see, if you said you were Presbyterian, they'd shoot you. <laughs> because Presbyterians, to the primitive, hard-shell Baptists, they, they weren't Christian at all, and the way you settled things was with a gun. Uh, <clears throat> Bob became interested in Sunday schools, in education, and later when he tried to do that, his life was threatened with a gun for introducing Sunday schools. He decided to be a minister. He wanted to be an educated minister. He had not finished high school yet, and so he had before him 11 straight years of education. Went to Union Seminary, a theological seminary in Richmond. And while he was there, he preached in some fine pulpits in Washington, D.C., at Yale Chapel. And on graduation, he was given a prom the promise of a prominent pulpit in North Carolina. But on June 3, 1926, he said, I'm going back to my people on Buffalo Mountain because they need somebody. They need somebody from the outside to come in and help them. <clears throat> and that's what he did. And the first thing they said to him when he got back, uh, Pastor Childress, you'd better wear a gun. And he said, I haven't worn a gun since I was a young fellow, and I don't think I'll start now. And he wouldn't put on a gun. <laughs> how Bob Childress moved the mountain people <clears throat> and how he changed them, I'll come back to in a little bit when I come back to why my mother, I think, was reading this book. Uh, but I'll just say at this point that uh, my father and my mother came to Virginia in 1953. I was about two years old. 
And you see, uh, he, my father started a church in the suburbs of Richmond, Virginia, which became one of the biggest church in the suburbs of Richmond, Virginia. And he would later become the director of mission ministries for the Virginia Baptist General Mission Board for over 27 years, working with Baptist churches throughout the state of Virginia, including the mountains of Southwest Virginia. I'll come back to that in a minute. But before I get to that, let's pause to consider two themes that come out of this story of the mountain people, Baptist and hard to shell. Let's pick those up for a moment. Um, uh, this is the university part, by the way. <clears throat> so if you start fading off, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll know to move to the therapy part, but whatever. <laughs> Um, the Buffalo Mountain people were Baptists. We're Baptists. Have you noticed that in the title of this church, University Baptist Church? Uh, simple, isn't it? Um, they're Baptists. We're Baptists. What could be simpler? Uh, there's a slide that will come up now about the Baptist family tree in the USA. If you think it's simple, you can't even read that probably. But that's according to the, uh, the uh, Association of Religion Data Archive. You can go to thearda.com and pick up any of the family trees of any religion uh, in the world if you want. That, that chart of the Baptist family tree, that's not so simple. And how are we alike and how are we different from the hardshell Baptists? the primitive Baptists of Buffalo Mountain. If we're thinking about our identity in this period, interim period of a church, we all know a little bit about our roots, I would think, <laughs> uh, because some of that's being carried forward consciously and unconsciously in the life of the church. Oh, there's the therapy part. <clears throat> uh, the hard shell Baptists were from the primitive Baptist tradition defined by hyper-Calvinism, John Calvin being a writer in the 16th century that influenced Protestantism, but they took that writing to the extreme, especially around the concept of predestination. No need for missions, because anybody who's gonna be saved has already been saved from the beginning of creation. No need for education, why do that? It won't change anything. Uh, no need to go outside of your clan because everything's predestined from the beginning. That was an extreme form, hyper-Calvinism, that the primitive Baptists held. Uh, the Bible was believed implicitly. And as with all Baptists, the Bible was extremely important. But the lens through which they read the Bible, saw the Bible, uh, led to not only the branching there, but on that whole Baptist family tree, the way you read scripture has determined every time that there's been a split within the Baptist family and another branch goes here and another branch goes there. They believe in the same thing, the authority of scripture, but how you read scripture leads to all of that. Well, uh, where does UBC fit in that family tree? Way up at the top are the primitive Baptists, and next to the primitive Baptists are progressive primitive Baptists. Now, what in the world is a progressive primitive Baptist? That's almost a contradiction in terms, in my opinion, but that's a judgment. Uh, <clears throat> university Baptist Church, well, let's pause for a minute. Here's the university part of the sermon again. Uh, in 1872, Joseph Jones wrote a history of the Baltimore Baptist Association. Every church in this area that was Baptist was a part of the Baltimore Baptist uh, Association at that time. <clears throat> and the uh, D.C. Baptist Convention, the Columbia Baptist, it wouldn't come along until 1877. So he wrote that in, uh, Joseph Jones wrote, in 1802, <clears throat> Uh, there was a church that was admitted to the Baltimore Baptist Association. It was the first church in, Baptist church in the Washington, D.C. area, and that church exists today as the first Baptist church of Washington, D.C. In 1811, another church was admitted to the Baltimore Baptist Association, and it had been constituted the year before in 1810 at the Navy Yard in Washington, D.C. And that church 
would become the second regular Baptist church. After a series of moves and mergers, if you go out here into the foyer, or as Jeanette would like to say in high church terms, the narthex, to the left on the wall is that cornerstone from the second regular Baptist church, 1810. And there's a whole history on that wall of moves and mergers that started in 1810 with a church at the Navy Yard, the University Baptist Church is, uh, is the outcome of that which was started in 1810 as the second regular Baptist church. Well, who were the regular Baptists? Are there irregular Baptists? <laughs> Not, there probably are. In my opinion, there are a lot of irregular Baptists. <laughs> uh, well, it is complicated. And again, it depends upon the lens through which you see and read scripture. Uh, <clears throat> now you see, Baptists will agree on some general things altogether. Number one, the supremacy of scripture. If you're a Baptist and you don't read scripture, get yourself together <clears throat> because Baptists read scripture. It's the authority in some sense of their lives. But how you interpret scripture, we, we can never agree on that. But the other thing that Baptists agree upon is separation of church and state, no state church. If somebody talks about Christian nationalism and they're a Baptist, they don't know their history. Our forefathers and mothers died and went to jail for the separation of church and state and the ability to baptize adults, not infants, under the lordship of Christ and that freedom Freedom of religion came from the Baptist forefathers in this country, and it was freedom of religion, freedom by religion, freedom in religion, and freedom from religion. You can thank your Baptist forefathers and mothers that, that they got the ear of Thomas Jefferson, and it's now in the Bill of Rights in our Constitution of this country, First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. That came from your Baptist forefathers and mothers. They died for that. We can, we can kind of agree on all of that. We just can't agree a whole lot on the interpretation of scripture. And so Baptists have divided around how you see, for instance, the atonement of Christ, the work of Christ. General Baptists, following John Wesley and the Arminians, said that there's an unlimited atonement. It's for everybody from the beginning of time to the end of time, the work of Christ for salvation is for everybody. A particular Baptist said, hold on a minute, we're gonna follow John Calvin, of the Protestant, and there's a limited atonement, and it's only for the elect. Um, who are the elect? Well, now you start debating and fighting over that. Uh, and then after the great awakenings of the 18th century, Baptists divided over to separate Baptists who were new lights, who had a more viable sign of the Holy Spirit in their worship services. They were more rural, poor, and emotionally expressive. Regular Baptists, remember, second regular Baptist church, were more educated, town people living north of the James River and held to the Philadelphia Confession of Faith, which was a progressive interpretation of the 1689 Second London Confession of Faith because they allowed for the singing of hymns in worship. That was liberal. Uh, and they later became, and this church was known as being in the 19th century, a progressive, unorthodox church because like Bob Childress, it advocated for Sunday schools. Mm -hmm. Now that was liberal, <clears throat> um, and that was the regular Baptist. Mm -hmm. So here we are in 2023, trying to figure out, like Baptists have always done, what is the true church? Mm -hmm. And in the face of unprecedented changes, including who do we turn to for association and advice? Who are we identifying with as Baptists now in this church with that kind of a history? 
in an atmosphere that could not care less about any of these things. And in fact, many of them have left the church saying, you guys fight over whatever scripture you want. We want nothing to do with you. And, and how do we make meaning in a world like that as Baptists with a history coming from the second regular Baptist church? Much of the history is playing out before us. We are a part of the Alliance of the Baptists, and I, in my opinion, they carry the Armenian General Baptist side of the family tree. We're a part of that. In the early 2000s, this church decided no longer to be, about the, be a part of the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, why? Because they said that women could not be in the pulpit and we differed on social justice issues as well. If we had not stepped out ourselves, uh, as of this past June, we have been forced out, because the Southern Baptist Convention forced out Saddleback Church, 56,000 member Saddleback Church, because they allowed a woman to speak in the pulpit. We decided we were no longer a part of that. We, that that's not our association. We're also a part of the, 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 the American Baptists, coming from the Northern Baptist Convention that split off from the Southern Baptists around the Civil War time over the issue of slavery. And the ABC USA is not really alliance. It's not more extreme Calvinism. It's somewhere, uh, uh, Curtis, you'll have to tell me, somewhere in the middle. I'm sure they still attuned to the Baptist Confession of Faith, but somewhere between the lines of that. But we also have in this congregation, National Baptists, the Black Baptists, the Black Baptist churches are a whole other history. And, and some of it's on that family tree that you saw. Some of it is not. <clears throat> Uh, we have people from countries around the world bringing their traditions here. And that's all playing itself out. It's like the whole Baptist family tree is playing itself out before us right here in this place. And in my opinion, is this not the progressive edge, as progressive as Sunday schools back in the 19th century, in which we become a school where we teach not only interfaith dialogue, but intrafaith dialogue, and learn how to talk to one another about our differences around scripture. Wouldn't that be a liberal progressive thing? I would think hold to the Baptist principles about the importance of scripture, about separation of church and state, about religious freedom. But religious freedom is not unbridled individualism as the dominant culture would say. Freedom in this sense is the freedom to have difficult conversations about scripture and about our lives and how we're interacting with a world that is constantly changing in ways that are just flying out all over the place. How will we read and interpret scripture, be inclusive, with whom will we associate on how to raise our children, educate our children, the role of women in the church, issues of race and, and justice and justice, the relationship of, of faith and science with regards to things as human sexuality, climate change, the understanding of the universe, and things like artificial intelligence. Oh, by the way, speaking of artificial intelligence, I asked ChatGPT to produce a sermon for me on the different ways Christians interpret scripture. In 30 seconds, do you see the temptation here for pastor? You know, it takes 15 to 20 hours to write a sermon. In 30 seconds, ChatGPT gave me a sermon that's shorter and no more understandable than the one that you're hearing. Why don't we go with that? And it was entitled, Exploring the Tapestry of Scriptural Interpretation. These are the different ways historically we've interpreted the Bible. If you're stuck in one, get another one. If we're gonna do a school of intrafaith dialogue at a place like this, you need different ways to interpret scripture. This list, by the way, is incomplete. ChatGPT didn't get it all. <clears throat> but you wouldn't know that if you hadn't done other study around it. Uh, but I like the way that ChatGPT concluded the sermon that it gave me. 
better than my sermon. It says, dear brothers and sisters, the beauty of the Christian faith lies in the diversity of scriptural interpretation. Let us embrace the fact that there are ways, various ways to explore and apply scripture, and let us engage in respectful dialogue and learning from one another. May we approach the study of the Bible with humility, open hearts, and a desire to grow in faith. Now that's artificial intelligence. It sounds better than natural intelligence to me. <clears throat> Maybe we incorporate artificial intelligence in how we interpret scripture. I don't know, it's a new day. And we're in a new place, trying to be a new church that's got all of that history right here in this building. It's amazing. And it's why I like this church, because we can have all those kinds of discussions if we'll have them and if we'll read scripture together. But I said we were not only going to talk about Baptists, we were going to talk about hard shell. That's the other theme, and I'll close with that. Of course, um, Technically, we are very different from the hard-shell ba hard Baptists of, of Buffalo Mountain, as I pointed out. We're not hyper-Calvinistic in our theology. Uh, but we would be wise to humbly consider whether or not there are some hard-shell characteristics in our own lives. Everybody ought to ask that question. For instance, when I drive through rural Virginia or Maryland, I often laugh to myself when I see a political sign that says, God, guns, and country. <clears throat> and I inwardly joke, the spirit of hard shell Baptists are still alive. If you would only add whiskey to that sign, <clears throat> in fact, some people in my family would join that church in a moment. <clears throat> God, guns, whiskey, and country. Uh, <clears throat> but if I do that in a judgmental and scoffing way, and laugh at the people who are Christians behind that sign, then it is saying more about my hard shell than about their hard shell. Mm -hmm. Because I've just cast judgment on my Christian brothers and sisters, whether they're political differences or not. Mm -hmm. That's my hard shell. Mm -hmm. David Augsburger, in attempting to train culturally sensitive counselors, referred to the hard shell characteristics defining people who are encapsulated in their own country. And hence the Malayan proverb that says, we are like the frog under the coconut shell. And the image was clear, the frog having never left or escaped the boundaries of the coconut shell had a very limited world, dark and silent in times. And encapsulation, Augsburger says, becomes another word for human sin, where we think that our way of seeing the world is absolute and totalizing order equivalent to the kingdom of heaven. But all we can see is what's under the coconut shell. The Buffalo Mountain people were encapsulated in the subculture found in an eight square mile piece of geography in Southern Virginia, almost similar to an alcoholic family system in which you don't go out of the system in order to solve your problems, encapsulation. And one would think in the digital age that it would be impossible to be encapsulated like that. But I guarantee you that we are encapsulated digitally in the echo chambers of social media. And you're being fed stuff that keeps you encapsulated in a certain kind of coconut shell that makes you angry, makes you click here or click there. We've got coconut shells in our pockets with our iPhones mm -hmm. or with our computers. And we can be as encapsulated as the people in the mountains of Southwest Virginia. And Christians, in their attempt to come together in like-minded associations, can become encapsulated and fail to deal with the new realities demanding new answers in a new world. Most religion that gets shouted at political rallies is nothing more than the shellacking of one's coconut shell. And the same can be said of most religious conventions. They're simply shellacking their coconut shell and making the people happy who think like them. What in the world would it be like to get out of your coconut shell and talk to other people around things like scripture? 
I mean, it boggles my mind. And we're going to have to face that question ourselves, for instance, in the building of a new building, because we're either going to build something that's creative or we're going to build a shiny new coconut shell. Which is it going to be? Can we come out from under our coconut shell and have what the freedom that Baptists say is the freedom to have difficult conversations? We need that as a congregation. Jesus referred to the hardened shells as hardened hearts, or the hard shells as hardened hearts. Picking up the words of the prophet Isaiah, in which he said, having eyes to see and ears, do you not see, do you not hear? Are your hearts hardened? He was talking about the coconut shells, and that all human beings have it. And as the ad on TV that comes now, Jesus gets us. Jesus gets us, why, why do you have a coconut shell? It's simply survival. Here's the therapy part. We build coconut shells to survive. The problem is the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of the empire, meaning that the world around us and the dominant culture will always make you feel that you're working with a scarcity model, not enough bread, not enough nurture, not enough power, not enough control, not enough likes on social media, not enough knowledge, not enough spirit, not enough life, not enough salvation, not enough grace, not enough heaven. It's a scarcity model. And those in power either will make you poor, built on a class system or a race system, or the marketing will make you think you're poor even though you have more than anybody in the rest of the world. It's a scarcity model. And it helps us build coconut shells because we're afraid somebody's gonna take what we've got. And the kingdom of heaven, Jesus proclaims, there's not only enough. The kingdom of heaven, the community of heaven, there will always be baskets left over. Can we operate with that kind of model? and somehow teach the world? Get out of the scarcity model that somebody has trained you in your encapsulated world to live out of and have the courage because you'll never come out of your coconut shell if you don't get the bread thing right. The reason we're under the coconut shell is we're afraid we step out, we're gonna lose something. You gotta get the bread thing right. There's enough bread, there's enough to go around, and we need to support those systems that say, if there's not enough to go around, we've got the wrong system. And we advocate the kingdom of God, the community of God in that. So let us come out. Bob Childress got the bread thing right. He turned down the pulpit that will give him more money, whatever. He went back to his people. He got the bread thing right. No scarcity model. And he found a way, he could do that, because he found a way to get off the mountain, get out from under the coconut shell, both physically and educationally, and then he went back to help people rather than judging them as wrong. And he did so not only with acts of charity, but he built educational systems, religious and secular, he gave employment, creating sawmills and building churches out of local stone. And he did this not only for the white men, but for the women, for the gypsies in the community, and for the African Americans. He got the bread thing right. Uh, I'm wondering in this interim period, can we learn from people like Bob Childress and get the bread thing right? You see, I. I think my mother was reading this book at the end of her life because at the end of your life or the end of significant periods in your life, you always do life review. And you see, Bob Childers died in 1956. She came with my father at Richmond in 1953. And you see, she and my father picked up the story of the likes of Bob Childers. And my father, in his ministry, would work with Virginia Baptists to come out of the encapsulation of segregation 
out of the encapsulation of Protestant Catholic animosity, writing a manual of marriage between Protestants and Catholics. He would work to come out of the encapsulation of anti-immigration at that time, Cuban refugees, Southeast Asian refugees, giving them homes and building ethnic congregations throughout the state of Virginia. And out of the encapsulation of reading scripture in a way that excluded women. And in his post-professional life, even more difficult, learning to read scripture coming out of the encapsulation of homophobia. I have felt a responsibility to pick up the story. I hope my children will as well. And this church, I think, prepared by somebody like John Burns, has the ability to pick up the anti-encapsulation story of church, Baptist or otherwise, even as we pick up the story of the second regular Baptist church established in the Navy Yard in 1810. And maybe in some increments in our lifetime, move it a little bit forward towards the kingdom or the community of God in this place. That to me is the exciting task before us if we can learn to read scripture together differently and have the freedom to have tough conversations. Amen.